Good morning, 10th grade pre-AP. Mr. D here. It's a very chilly Wednesday morning up in Tennessee. I'll try to send a few cold breezes down your way. Uh, I think we're in the 30s this morning. So anyway, I'm uh, kind of dressed in my rugged gear. So today we're going to talk about Separate Peace Chapter 3. Again, because I don't want to focus on me, I don't really, I'm going to try to turn this thing around and I don't know if I know how to do it or not. So let's see. I'm really having a bad time with this. All right, I'll just do it this way. I think that looks all right. If it doesn't, <clears throat> don't worry about it. Just close your eyes, go to a happy place, and listen to your lecture. So, chapter 3 <clears throat> starts off where Gene says, you know, Finney saved my life, but he also practically lost it for me. And what you're going to start to notice more and more and more is how critical Gene is becoming of Finney. Um, he even says at the end of the first paragraph, I didn't need to feel any tremendous rush of gratitude toward Phineas. So the Super Suicide Society is meeting on a regular basis, <clears throat> and the new members are supposed to jump at every meeting. And um, one quote that's interesting from Gene, about a page in, he says, I went along, I never missed a meeting. At a time, it never would have occurred to me to say, oh, I don't feel like it tonight. And then he says at the end of that paragraph, acting against every instinct of my nature, I went without a thought of protest. So from there, they're skipping classes, they're missing meals, they're missing chapel, and doing all of these sorts of things because they're, you know, as they think of it, living on the edge. Um, one mention when they're given uh, badminton to play for like their afternoon sport they notice the seniors are off doing calisthenics. And with the whole calisthenics thing, they're seeing these older kids. And um, I'll just read you a little part here. The seniors had been trotted off to the improvised obstacle course in the woods or to have their blood pressure taken again or to undergo an insidious exercise. The cage, which consisted in stepping on a box and down again in rapid rhythm for five minutes, they were off somewhere shaping up for the war. So while they're off doing that, the boys decide badminton isn't exactly a manly game to play. So they get a medicine ball and they play blitzkrieg ball. They call it blitzball. Again, romanticizing the war. If you think about Hitler's um, fire warfare, his all-out attacks, his blitzkrieg strategy. Um, if you've not studied that yet in history, you could Google it. Um, basically, it's just like an all-out, very powerful, intense attack. And that was a strategy that allowed him to extend Germany's borders and um, infiltrate a lot of other countries and take them over. Well, anyway, we're not going to get into the historical aspect of it. Um, just know that Blitzball is a reference to that, an allusion to that, and it's also romanticizing the war. So... They're playing this game, and Phineas is very well suited to it because he's fast, he's strong, he's tough, he's aggressive, all those sorts of things. And we start to meet a couple other minor characters in the game of Blitzball. Um, one of them is Leper, Elwin Leper Le Pellier, who doesn't want the ball. Tells you a little bit about his character, and I mean, obviously, by his nickname, Leper. Um, you can understand why, not the most aggressive kid, not somebody who's really into those intense sort of things. Leper will become very important later in the story. Um, now there's a dynamic that develops that I didn't focus on a whole lot yet, but I'm going to start now, and that is the reflective aspect. And what I mean by this is, you get a sense that the story is being told in the moment, but you also get a sense that there is the sort of like the stepping back and the looking back as a wiser older person as an adult and when gene talks about how everyone has a moment in history which belo uh, belongs particularly to him it is the moment when his emotions achieve their most powerful sway over him and then he talks about how that moment for me was the war and he 
goes into a bunch of different characteristics of just what was happening in terms of sacrifices that were made, in terms of the trains being delayed or late or crowded, um, in terms of the various leaders of countries, um, FDR, Winston Churchill, Stalin, uh, he talks about Mussolini. Um, in addition to that, think in your own lives of what this current situation with the, the pandemic, think about what that is going to do to shape your life. Think about all the ways that your life has changed in the last, geez, just a couple of weeks, month. Um, between having to school the way we're doing it now, which is really, um, it's, it's different. I don't particularly enjoy it. You know, I get my energy from working with you guys face to face. And I think a lot of you get your enthusiasm for your subject matters from your teachers and from their, their methods of presenting stuff. So, you know, this is kind of a detached way of, um, going about education, but we, you know, we have to keep moving forward. So there's that whole like aspect of sacrifice, the aspect of, um, maintaining some semblance of normalcy. Uh, think about your social lives. Some of you probably have parents who say friends are not coming in the house. Um, you might have a boyfriend or a girlfriend who they want to get together, or maybe you do get together, but maybe that's the only person you're allowed to see, or maybe a best friend or something like that. Um, think of older family members, um, any family members, locally, out of state. Think of the people who you normally see who you haven't seen. You know, this, this moment in history is probably going to be something that does impact your life. Um, so I want you to be able to make that connection to Gene being very reflective. Um, from that part, we get to the pool. And again, Phineas being very athletic and just gifted um, physically, he notices, oh, this A. Hopkins Parker um, did this race and has a record for a certain time. And he's like, I think I can beat it. And he just goes out and beats it. And he doesn't want Gene to tell anybody about it. And Gene wants to get a school official. He wants it timed. He wants Finney to um, get credit for the record. He can't believe that he just broke the record that easily. And for Phineas, it's no big deal. Now think about how many of your friends, people you know, who maybe they've never done the sport that you're good at. Maybe they've never surfed. Maybe they've never um, you know, played basketball or softball. And all of a sudden, they start to do it, and within a week, they're better than you, and you've been playing your whole life. We all have a friend like that, and Phineas is that person. So for Gene, it was really sort of uh, disheartening to see how easily he broke the record and then to see how uh, nonchalantly he brushed it off as if to say, no, nah, I just wanted to see if I could do it. It's no big deal. And, um, you know, that, that took some root in Gene. Um, okay, I'm getting closer to the end of the chapter now, and as we get into the last couple of pages, Finney says, you know, hey, let's go to the beach today, and I'm just going to read you this paragraph. It is about one, sorry, my fingers aren't working, they're cold, three pages from the end. The beach was hours away by bicycle, forbidden, completely out of all bounds, going there risked expulsion, destroyed the studying I was going to do for an important test the next morning, blasted the reasonable amount of order I wanted to maintain in my life, and it also involved the kind of long, labored bicycle ride I hated. All right, I said. Why does Gene go? Well, obviously, he doesn't want to be replaced. He doesn't want somebody else to get to spend that time with Finney. Um, I think deep down he knows Finney's good for him because he, he brings him out of his shell. But at the same time, um, it does make him very critical of Phineas because he's always getting him into these situations, just like being in the tree, just like the, the um, loss of his balance and then Phineas grabbing onto him the way we started the chapter. So they're at the beach, they're on the boardwalk, they... Um, 
basically go in the ocean and just just horse around. Uh, the most important part of it all is the very last page. Um, enough rules uh, were broken that night. Neither of us suggested going into any of the honky tonks or beer gardens. We did have one glass of beer each at a fairly respectable looking bar convincing or seeming to convince the bartender that we were old enough by showing forged draft cards. So again, they're taking advantage forged draft cards, it's like a fake ID, um, showing, Hey, if we're old enough to be drafted, then we should be old enough to, you know, enjoy some adult, um, privileges. So again, it's that youthful irresponsibility and the not, quite understanding the severity. Um, but then from there, Phineas says to him, you can't go to the beach with anybody. You can't just do this with any old friend. It has to be somebody you're close to. It has to be a best pal, which is what you are, he says to Gene. And it ends, and there was silence on his doom. And I wrote in some comments to you guys about just the use of the word his, his doom. You know, why is that? Why was that? And then the very last part, acknowledging that it was a very courageous thing to say. You know, you didn't admit your your closeness to someone. Um, it was an awkward thing to do. I, may, I made that comment to many of you in uh, email responses as well. Um, but then the very, very end of the chapter, Gene says, I should have told him then that he was my best friend and rounded off what he had said. I started to, I nearly did, but something held me back. Perhaps I was stopped by that level of feeling, deeper than thought, which contains the truth. Well, what is the truth? And we're going to start to explore uh, within Gene why he can't just say to Finney, you're my best pal too. We're going to explore in Gene why and how the reflective um, style by John Knowles, the author, uh, allows him to see it now, but maybe back then not quite see the significance of some of these interactions. Uh, so these are some things that I'd like you guys to look forward to a little bit. So your job today is to send me a response, and I want one of two things. Like before, you could either send me some sort of an insight that the lecture brought up that you didn't necessarily pick up on and now you do. And if you're kind of getting tired of doing that, cause that's kind of been your prompt for the first three chapters. The other one could be just how this process of going through this moment in history might change you or did change you or just how you feel it's going to affect your life from this point forward. Maybe this is that moment. So like Gene, um, think about and write about, give me a, an idea of uh, the impact it's having on you. So I hope you guys are doing well. Um, hope to be able to see you guys soon. And uh, with any luck, we'll get through this quickly and uh, get back to business and back to the classroom and all that wonderful stuff. So have a good day and uh, I will see you online, I guess. Peace.